prayer? Roger? Oh. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you so much of all of our blessings. Lord, we thank you of the promises in your holy word that we can sing that song anticipating that day when we can be in heaven with you. Lord, we, we thank you for your love, your mercy, your plan of salvation, and Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. We thank you for that so much. We thank you for the church. Lord, we pray that, that as your congregation here, that, that we would do our best to obey your word and be that shining example you would have us to be every day. Lord, be with all of those here. Uh, we've mentioned so many that are in need, Lord. We ask you to be with Brother Lawson in particular this morning, Lord, that he might get better and be able to come home. Lord, we know the guys struggle daily with so many physical ailments. We ask you to bless them and comfort them, that these would be good days for them. Be with Sister Sammy and Brother Jimmy and so many others, Lord, and those who are friends and relatives of our members here. You know all of their needs, Lord. We ask that your will would be done, that they would be blessed, and their families would be strengthened. Lord, we pray as we worship you this morning that we'll do those things that are acceptable to you, pleasing to you, and that we'll be attentive listeners to the lesson. We will all be edified and leave here in a, in a better uh, frame of mind, Lord, and with our... <coughs> mind on you daily. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Number 760. First, second, and fourth verse, seven, six. <coughs> Who followed Jesus, standing for the right, holding up his banner in the thickest fight, listening to his orders, ready to obey? Who will follow Jesus, serving him today? Who will follow Jesus, who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus, who will make the fly? I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus in my streets and ways? Working for the Master, giving Him the praise. Earnest in His vineyard, honoring His laws. Faithful to his counsel, watchful for his cause. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus in his work of love? Leading others to him, lifting prayers above. Courage, faithful servant, in his word we see. On our side forever, will the Savior be? Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side. Master, hear my Number 17. After this song, Brother Roger will bring our lesson. The melody of this song, if you're not familiar with it, is the same as praise God from whom all blessings flow, if that, if that helps. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth verses, number 17. <laughs> oh, people that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice, him serve with fear.
church and have participated <clears throat> excuse me, in the worship of the church and even at times having preached on the 100th Psalm which will be our text this morning I did not realize that that hymn was in our books I don't know what all hymn books that have it included I do know the song was written in the late 1500s and so it's probably been in several hymn books since that time. And it follows line to line with thought with the 100th Psalm. There are four stanzas to that hymn. There are five verses in Psalm 100. One of the things that helps us to appreciate the Psalms or should is that that was the hymnal or the Hebrew hymn book. For many years, that's what they would use when they would sing praises to God. And you'll recall that in Colossians 3.16, Ephesians 5.19, Paul talks about our singing, and, and he says that we sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Uh, and, and so the early church, being primarily early on made up of Jewish people, naturally would have included the psalms in their worship to God. This psalm is about giving thanks and glory and honor to God. If you read through it, you might take note that the Lord is mentioned in one way or another 12 times in these five verses. When you read the, the emphasis of what is done by the worshipers, as you look at the words of Psalm 100, it's all to the Lord. It has something to do with the Lord. That first stanza in your King James Version of the Bible would say, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. The New American Standard reads, shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth. And then he says, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Your King James would say, joyful singing in the New American Standard. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. Give thanks to him and bless his name. Why? The psalmist is not identified here, but whoever he was says, for the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness or truth endures to all generations. Those who study the Hebrew language will come up with different translations of some of the words in this psalm. If you compare translations, which is a good way to study the Bible, you'll find different wording. But you get the gist of it. And I want you to think for just a moment about worship at, at this time. We don't know who wrote the psalm, so we don't know exactly whether the, they were going to the courts of the tabernacle or the courts of the temple. It really is irrelevant. Both of those were places of worship for the Jewish people until Solomon built the temple, the people of God would meet in the tabernacle, that moving tent that God had Moses to have the children of Israel to build. 
text says in your King James Bible, make a joyful noise or shout joyfully. I don't know how the Jewish people viewed God unless it, you're talking about people like David or Asaph or others who wrote the Psalms. But they should look at God as someone worthy of being joyful about knowing. We should be joyful that we know there is a God. Amen. And that we have the privilege to sing praises to the only eternal being in the universe from which all things come. I want to look first of all at how this psalm would work for these people in that time and then I want to make some applications to us in the 21st century. I do reading from people who know the Hebrew language because I don't know the Hebrew language. I haven't studied it very much but this joyful shout or this this joyful noise, it, it requires some energy on the part of the singer, and it is talking about singing, and, and there's some vibrancy, and, and someone, Brother Eddie Clower said in his commentary that it is a joyful shout of triumph. One of the things that you would relate to that idea is that God in, had always planned for his people once they left Egypt to settle in the land of Canaan. When God led them out of Egypt, they were victorious people. They had something to shout about. You may remember what Miriam did as she led the women in singing. There was a joyful exuberance. Yes, they complained in the wilderness, but God didn't want them to be complaining, and he was not happy about it when they did. And once they settled in the land of Canaan, they were <coughs> destroyed all the enemies, all the ungodly people. And, and when they didn't listen to God, they lost the battles. When they listened to God, they won. But there's triumph in God for the faithful person of God. There's something to be joyful about, to, to thank God for the victories of life as a Hebrew person, to be able to serve him in, under a special guidance and direction under God's law and God's providence for those people that did not come to other people. I want you to notice that he says, serve the Lord with gladness. Context helps us understand the meanings of words. This word typically meant to serve God as a slave. But that does not fit the context of what's being said here. One person noted as they elaborated on the meaning of this, why would the psalmist choose the word serve with regard to a slave? But he says, you do so with gladness. Serve the Lord with gladness. Worship should not be a drudgery. Do I have to go to church again, Mama? Now, you can understand little children may be saying that because of their immaturity and their lack of understanding. When I was a kid, I would rather have stayed home and played in the backyard. It's just be honest about it or play with my toys. And there's a point in life, however, when you become a Christian, no one should have to beg you to come to worship God. No one should have to plead with a Christian to assemble with the saints. It shouldn't have been going on then. It was a joyful, willful thing to serve the Lord with gladness. There was a time for the regular service of, of God in, in life, but here the context has to do with work. So maybe this is the idea where some got the phrase or the statement, worship service. Because it is a service to God. We're serving God when we sing, when we pray, when we preach, when we participate in the Lord's Supper, when we give. In, in a spiritual sense, it's a service to God. And I want you to notice there, there is expected from God, and this is probably the, the part where we have to make a powerful introspection of ourselves and, and think about what God wants. God is good. God is wonderful. There's no one like God. That is a message from Scripture that runs all through it. There's no one like Him. 
God created the heavens and the earth. God made the formed the earth into a place where a man and woman and people could live on it. He provided us with food by the and with water, with the, the animal, the vegetable kingdom, the animal kingdom, the water that we need for life, and and then he, he set the world and the globe in, in motion, and it goes around the sun, and we get our seasons, and, and we get sunshine, we get daytime and night, and we get everything we need, and then God made you out of dirt, men. He made you women out of Adam's rib, which was made of dirt, ladies. But God made us. God made us. There came a point in time where God had a discussion with a man by the name of Abraham in Genesis chapter 15 that of him all the nations of the earth would be blessed and his seed. And ultimately he'd be a blessing. He began with Abraham and then he and his wife Sarah had Isaac, and then Isaac had Jacob, and Jacob had Joseph, and on down the line goes through the generations of people, and we ultimately got Jesus. Thank God he, we have him. But God set all that in motion. God gave to Adam and Eve the commands in the garden. God served uh, as the God of his people until the law was given through Moses. That law was not given to Gentiles, but to the Jewish people, and it was good for them. It, it allowed them to know how to honor God. You shall have no other gods before me. We read in Exodus chapter 20. And you don't make any graven image. I don't want you to serve any idols. And he goes on through all those commands. The Ten Commandments laid the foundation for the law of Moses. And God was good to those people. He made a people. He made a nation of those people. And so you read that from that perspective. The psalmist says, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. I want you to notice what I caught as I read this. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. I'm not sure that meant the whole world as much as it was a statement of hyperbole for all the Hebrew people. And then serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself, he is God. It is he who has made us and we are his people. And the sheep of his pasture. Notice how the emphasis is on God. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Why? For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. His faithfulness to all generations. Notice the emphasis on God. I am convinced, and I always have to place myself in some of these statements. I'm convinced if more of us were happy with God, we'd show it. We'd demonstrate it. We wouldn't drag through our singing we wouldn't have to have somebody, we wouldn't have a, well, I've got to go to church again. And, and I think, no, you get to go and praise God. Can we restate what we're doing? That we get to assemble with precious people of God and sing praise to an eternal creator and sustainer, by the way. The psalmist says, says that, you shout joyfully to the Lord. At one point in history, the Septuagint translation was given to the Hebrew people. It was a Greek translation by 70 scholars in the Greek language because Greek was becoming the world language at that time. And now English is probably the most used language in the world. Nonetheless, the first word in that psalm, where in, in uh, I'm trying to remember which verse it is. I put a note here. But the first word that's used there to, to sing is, is to sing. It comes from the Greek word solo. That's what's used in Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16. To sing to God. I wonder why, I know that Greek 
sentence structure is different than English sentence <coughs> structure. I know that Hebrew and Greek sentence structures are different. Nonetheless, the first word is to sing. Obviously, the means by which you praise God is through singing. Now, some people's voices aren't as pretty as others. Some people have trouble singing and keeping a tune. They, they, they're not able to, 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 to repeat the, and follow the notes in music. You know that God does not care about that. He cares about what's coming from the heart to sing to him, to, to, to shout joyfully, serve the Lord with gladness, come before him with joyful singing. And I wonder, and, and I'll apply that in a moment, but I want to move back to the time. God wanted those people to be happy that they got to come into his presence. Now, he talks about coming through the gates. That would be the gates of the city of Jerusalem into his courts. There were various courts in the tabernacle and in the temple. But whenever you come into that city or come into the gates of that of the, the the courts of that temple, there's to be some measure of joy. They did not have Jesus. The animal sacrifices did not take care of sin, but it was God's plan for the time. He put, he put in place the, the priestly order. He put in place the order of worship and how they were to worship God with their sacrifices, when they were to do what, the feast, and what they did on this feast, what they did on that feast, and Whatever they would come to that tabernacle or that temple for, they were to shout joyfully to God. I like to be in an auditorium filled with people who sing. And I mean they put some energy into it. I know some people cannot sing energetically. They don't have the, the lung capacity. They may not have the voice for it. I don't believe the emphasis is on a physical action as much as it is what's going on on the inside of a person. Because even then, God would know not everybody could sing one as well as the other. This is not America's Got Talent. That's not what this worship is about then or today. But to shout joyfully to God and come before him. I want you to slow down with me for a minute. The, in, the introduction is, shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth, everybody, all of you Hebrew people, and all of you people, you serve the Lord with gladness. Be happy that you're doing this. Come before him, slow down, come before him for his presence. Whose presence was in that holy of holies when they went to that tabernacle? It was the almighty God, but once a year. As it is told by some historians that sometimes there came a point in history where the priest would have a, a rope or something tied around his ankle because only the high priest could go into the holy of holies. Why would they do that? Because if he died in there for some reason, they could drag him out because the average person could not do that. But the, every Jew could come to the tabernacle and praise God. They could all come to that temple and praise God. Everybody had different roles, but they all could do the same thing in that sense. And they come into the presence of God. That had to have been a wonderful thing. You know, they, they lived in a time We'll look at know that the Lord He Himself is God. There are different ways of, of considering that statement. When this was written, they were living in a land filled with idolatry and human philosophy. Those idols and those idol worshiping people caused no little trouble for the children of Israel for many years. And when they came to that, ultimately they came to that temple temple when finally it was built or the tabernacle beforehand that's a place where God was which God the only God the true and living God that had had brought them out of Egypt and placed them in a land of promise that flowed with milk and honey 
And even though there were times when they were disobedient, when they would repent, God would bless them over and over and over. And what a blessing it would be. Could they see God? No. They couldn't see him. But the text says he was there. When you read the dedication of the temple by King Solomon, there was a kind of a smoke that filled that temple when God's presence was there. I imagine that was an awesome experience, but they didn't see God, but he was there. Let's talk about it for ourselves in a few minutes, but stay with these people for a minute. And you need to remember and know that the Lord himself is God. Emphasize for a moment, no. You could not know that an idol was God's. Could idols speak? Could they walk? Someone was doing, recently doing uh, or some research on Easter Island. It, it's, it's like, it's not close to anything out in the middle of the Atlantic. It, it, I think it's five hours by plane from Chile to go over there. But it's out in the middle of the Atlantic, and, and you may have seen pictures. It has these statues, and it's like maybe from here up. And recently, some discover, they discovered that those statues go deep into the ground. They're huge. And, and, and they all face the island, and they've got their backs to the sea. And some have concluded, well, it had to be some kind of idol. And the representation was that those statues were kind of guardians of the people on that island. But the question was, how did they position them? And so some people have concluded that, that they, they would take those, they would carve them out of, they made them like out of the natural, a lot of ash from uh, eruption from volcano and such, but they, they made these statues, but they would, they'd have them stand up, then they tied ropes on them, and they'd have people in various positions, and that statue could walk. But it couldn't walk on its own. The people did it. Our God is not a statue nor an idol. He's not managed and manipulated and designed by man. He is the designer. He is a living God. He was alive before he ever made man. He's the true and living God, and he and you need to know this, the psalmist would say. Now, there are times when we look at the second half of verse 3 where it says, it is he who has made us and not we ourselves. Some translations would say, and we are his. I've often read that and kind of left it with, well, God created man. Well, he did. He created man in his own image and his own likeness, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. And he made man out of dirt, made woman out of, out of Adam's rib. God created, made man. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. I am certain that God wanted these people to know where they originated. I am not convinced that that's the emphasis of this statement. And I'll tell you why. Maybe they would reflect on where they came from. God did make them. But I believe the emphasis is on them as a nation. Notice what he says. Know that the Lord, he himself is God, and as he has made us, and not we ourselves, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. I'm convinced that the it's not discounting the fact that they knew God made them. I believe the emphasis is God made us a nation. He made us a people. We are his people, and we're sheep, the sheep of his pasture. Now, if a person thinks, I want you to notice the triad here, and it's interesting as you walk through it that, number one, you have, you have in this particular verse, know that the Lord is God, number one. Number two, it is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. Number three, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. And you'll have a triad also in verse 4. But notice how it breaks down to, to these, as you break down this triad here, that God was God. He was not some mythological God. He was not some idol buried up to his chest on Easter Island or anywhere else or the gods of the Philistines or the gods of the, of the other people, the, Assyri the Assyrians or anyone else. He was the God of heaven. But he made a nation. 
They come into the well, they come into the tabernacle or the temple as a people that God designed to exist. And Genesis chapter twelve and verse two, the Bible would helps us is God spoke to the father of this nation, Abraham. It's the first time we have a record of God speaking to him. And I want to notice a couple of things that he said to Abraham because it's foundational, it's fundamental. It's important to know. When he says in verse 2 of Genesis 12, and I will make you a great nation. Well, Abraham himself wouldn't be a nation, but the nation would come from him. From that man, a great nation, a great nation. God never says that about anybody else in the Old Testament unless he's talking about their power but these people being a great nation were a great nation for God and his purposes. Something else that he says in Genesis 12 too, and it says, I will bless you and make your name great and so you shall be a blessing. And so God began with Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and then you get the 12 tribes of Israel and, and all those people that settled in the land and they all came to Jerusalem once a year for a special feast to worship God. And they were his people. Why would, they, why would they come all the way as far north as they did or come all the way as far south as they did and shift it to the first century? Why would those people travel as far away, from as far away as Rome, Italy, to come to Jerusalem on Pentecost? because they came to worship God. I have to respect what those people did. They came to Jerusalem under the law of Moses to worship God. And the text says that, 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 that they that know he is God. He has made us. We are not we ourselves. God had to remind those people from time to time that he was the one who made those people. He, did, he made them and led them. We're going to look tonight at the prophet Malachi. Uh, Micah, I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. But look in your Bibles at Micah where God speaks to these people and he talks to them and, and, and he says in verse 4 of Micah 6, Indeed, I brought you up from the land of Egypt and ransomed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. And in other things, he reminds them of. Who brought those people later, after they ended up in Egyptian bondage, who brought them out? God did. Oh, how they whined and complained in the wilderness. <coughs> They didn't like the manna. They fussed about everything. We'd rather go back. There was better food back there in Egypt. And bless Moses' heart, he had to put up with them. But God kept working with them and leading them. And when they complained, sometimes he'd send, he'd send serpents among them. And, and, and it, it, God reached a certain point. Why? I brought you out of Egypt. I have a purpose for you. I have a plan for you. I want you to listen to me. I don't want you to complain. I want you, when you come and sing to me, to do it joyfully. Be happy that you're the people of God. And that kind of flies into the face of the attitude that some of those people had. But you know, God was the architect of that city. He was the architect of the tabernacle and the architect of the temple. That temple was built without one tool being laid upon a stone. I don't know how they did it, but they did. Now, think about these people, how God provided for those people. He says, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. That particular phrase implies God's <coughs> providence. And he took care of them. Sheep are totally dependent on their shepherd. They cannot survive on their own. Wild horses might, but sheep don't. Wild goats can, but 
sheep don't typically. They, they have to have a shepherd. They don't survive on their own. And we're compared, they're compared to sheep, like sheep under a shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, the psalmist would say. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Listen to him. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That same psalmist would say in Psalm 122 and verse 1, I was glad when they said to me, let us go up to the house of the Lord. David was happy to go and praise God. Oh, that all the other Hebrew people had been that way. They loved David. They loved David even in the time of Jesus. And I don't care. And then every time you go to a funeral, 99.9% .9 of the time, Psalm 23 is printed in the little handout with the person's obituary and the little introduction or description of the person because it's a precious psalm. <clears throat> with that psalm in mind, the Lord is my shepherd. That's what Psalm 100 is saying. He, he, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Those people belong to God, but God took care of them. Why couldn't you see? Whoa, what's, that's something to sing about, isn't it? That God took care of those people to praise him for what he had done. And he says, then enter into his gates with thanksgiving. God designed the city of Jerusalem. He told them what to put. It had all these different gates for different purposes, and it was all designed by God, the architect. And you're coming into a place that I said for you to build. I told you how to build it. And it also was a place of protection to come into those gates. Once they were inside those city gates, behind those walls, they were relatively safe, especially when they were faithful to God. And then come into his courts. That, those courts are the courts would be the courts of the temple once it was built with thanksgiving. What a thing to be thankful for. To remind them. The one thing that Passover did was to remind them that their firstborn didn't die. And also, after all those ten plagues landed in a very powerful way against Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And then God led them out on dry land across the Red Sea. He was with them all the way. You need to be thankful for what God has done for you once you get into this temple. And sacrifices were being made even though the, the, those sins were remembered every year. They were powerful for the moment. It's what God expected. And what was the reason for coming into that tabernacle? The primary reason? To thank God. Enter into his courts with thanksgiving. Whose courts? God's courts. His courts with thanksgiving. And inside to bless his holy name as the only true and true God. And then the psalmist says, let me tell you why. Let me tell you why you should do this. For the Lord is good. I get so frustrated with people who use God's name in vain, in a cursing sense. There's no, and they'll do the same thing with the name of Jesus. I can't think of anything much worse than that unless it's to just denounce God altogether. But the Lord is good. And I don't care what the people around the Hebrews people said. God was good to those people. He was very good to those people. He provided them with their food and, and, and the protection. And, the, and even though they wanted a king against God's will, God, God, is, God made it clear, if that king will do what I said, I'll still bless you. Unfortunately, most of them didn't. But God is good. The, the, the lack of the rebellion and the disregard of God of man by man has nothing to do with his goodness. He's still good. He's still God. And 
He has loving kindness and it's everlasting. God is, so you see another triad here. Number, look at the triad in verse three. The Lord is God. He made us and we're his people. Triad in verse number four. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. There are your three. Look at verse five. Here are your three. For the Lord is good. Number one. Number two is loving kindness is everlasting. Number three is his faithfulness to all generations. You could make lessons from all, all of those verses, three-point lessons, and one preacher said, well, if it's got four points, it has too many. It has to be three. <laughs> well, I want you to notice when you go to Lamentations chapter 3, beginning with verse 19, Jeremiah would write, during a very difficult time of the people of Israel, remember my affliction and my wandering, the wormwood and bitterness. Surely my soul remembers and is bowed down within me. This I recall to my mind. Therefore I have hope. The Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. I love Jeremiah. A hard time. So then you have the loving kindness of God being forever. He's always good. He's always having loving kindness toward his people. And he is... He has an ongoing dependability and trustworthiness. There aren't many things in this world that I can trust. I can't trust money. I can't trust health. I can't trust people to be perfect. I can't trust <clears throat> the weather. There, you just can't trust the things, the material things of this life, but we can always trust God. I'll never leave you nor forsake you, Hebrews 13 and verse 5 would tell us. Parallel some of these things to the New Testament quickly. In James 5 and verse 13, James says, if anyone among you is suffering, he must pray. If anyone is cheerful, he is to sing praises. When you're having a hard time, pray. I don't believe the psalmist is saying that you always ought to sing with exuberance, but when you sing to God, when there needs to be a measure of happiness. When Paul wrote his letter to the church at Ephesus, one of the things he said in verse 19, aside from speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks. Why? Because he's worthy of it. For all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. We need to be thankful as Christians. You know, the Bible teaches us in Ephesians 1 and verse 3 that every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places is in Christ. Sometimes, sometimes people say, yeah, that means there aren't any outside of Christ. That's true, but let's not miss Paul's point. His point is all those spiritual blessings are in Christ. If you're a Christian, you're blessed with everything God has to offer. If you're a child of God, you're blessed with everything God has to offer. He leaves nothing out. Therefore, he is worthy of praise. He's worthy of being thanked. And, and, so you, and then you see the, the one God included in all, all three personalities in God when Jesus is born, that, that God the Father was the Father of Christ. The Holy Spirit played the role in Mary being with child and then God in the flesh was born of Mary. I mean, we need to thank God for Jesus because there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. In him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins through his blood according to the riches of his grace. Ephesians 1 and verse 7. And there's no redemption in no one else. He bought us from sin. He paid the price for it. Sometimes we talk about the value and importance of baptism, and we should, but we don't need to forget the blood of Jesus because if it weren't for the blood of Jesus, nothing else we do matters. In him we have redemption through his blood, 
according the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace there's no grace outside of Christ there's no spiritual favor from God outside of Christ but it's in Christ we ought to be the happiest people <clears throat> in the world when it comes to what God has done for when you get home this afternoon, read Isaiah 53. Look for that verse where it talks about the stroke being due to us, not to Jesus. Read it this afternoon. Meditate on what the Lord did. So we have, we ought to be thankful for it. That we know God, that we have salvation offered to us. Jesus, the teacher. Jesus, the the sacrificer of himself. Jesus, the mediator between man and God, our advocate, 1 John 2, verse 2. When we, when we sin, there's an advocate between us and the Father. And he's the high priest that you read about in the letter to the Hebrews, the one who offered a spiritual sacrifice and continues to do so. He's our high priest. So when we come into the assemblies of God's people, we ought to be happy to be here because of who God is, what he has done, what he has offered, what he's made available to us as his people. Peter would write in 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. That's what Peter's saying. Do, you, do we appreciate the kindness of God? And notice what he says, talking about Jesus, and coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. How does God see Jesus? Choice and precious? Well, what about his people? Well, you are as living stones, having been built up as a spiritual house. What for? A holy priesthood. To what, what else for, Peter? To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Move it to the 21st century, 1st century, 21st century. Moving it away from the time of the tabernacle or the temple and to the church, and we come in here to offer up spiritual sacrifices to God. There's something wrong with people that claim to be Christians and don't want to do that. There's something wrong with them. There, there's something missing in their lives, and, and, and it obviously must be an appreciation for what God has done. But then you move it to those who want to do this. There's something right with those who do it. It says, for it is contained in Scripture, verse 6, Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value, then, is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and to this doom they were appointed. And that's people who refuse to listen to the word of God. They're appointed to doom. But talk about God's people. Applying Psalm 100. You are a chosen race or generation. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. A people for God's own possession. And if God possessed those people and led them like a shepherd over the sheep, how much more Jesus for us? And what for? So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Why? For once you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God who had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That's something to sing about. That's something to be happy about. That God has been merciful. Read Psalm 100 a little differently next time and apply it to Christian life. Maybe you can add some things to it that I left out. God wants us to believe that his son is dead. Unless you believe that I am, Jesus would say, you'll die in your sins. In John 8, 24, he doesn't want us to. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him 
should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3 and verse 16. That faith will lead us to repent of our sins. Luke 13 and verse 3. So that we will not perish. To confess him before men. Like the eunuch did in Acts 8 and verse 36. To be baptized for the remission of sins. Like some 3,000 people did on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And I'll throw this in here before I finish up. I wonder what the singing was like that day. It must have been wonderful. If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, please come as we stand and sing. Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. I want thee forever to live in my soul. Break down every idol, cast out every pill. Now wash me and I shall be wise.
we've come to the portion of our service where we observe the Lord's Supper. We do this in remembrance of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We remember He willingly came to this earth to die in our place for our sins. When we read our scriptures, all the Gospels are in agreement about the Lord's Supper. They don't say it word for word, but when you read each Gospel, it is the same account. This morning, we'll read uh, Mark's account of the Lord's Supper. We'll turn to chapter 14, and we'll start reading at verse 22. And as they were eating, Jesus, he took bread, he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body. <clears throat> and then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it, and he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. We would ask Brother Rocky to say a prayer for the bread. Our wonderful Father in heaven, we thank you for being so kind and benevolent toward us in giving your son and for your son so willingly giving his life. May we this morning remember that he died, he did suffer and die on our behalf, and this bread is a memorial for that death and how valuable it is for us. We ask this in Christ's name, amen. Amen. Let us pray. Our dear Father in heaven, we would ask a blessing on this cup this morning. This cup which represents the blood which your son so lovingly shed on the cross that we may have eternal life with you in heaven, Father. We pray this in your son's name, in Jesus Christ. Amen.
uh, separate and apart from the Lord's Supper is our opportunity to give back a portion. We're not required to give everything we have. We're required to give with our heart how we feel. And when we give, we should give with joy. This morning scripture, we're going to read from, once again, from the Gospel of Mark. And we're going to turn, turn to the 12th chapter. And we're going to read how we should give. We'll start at verse 41. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury, and he saw, saw how the people put money into the treasury. And many who were rich, they put in much. Then one poor widow came, and she threw in two mites, which make a quadrant. So he called his disciples to himself, and he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who has given to, to the treasury. For they all put in out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. Let's take this as an example. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we pray that we use these funds to further your kingdom here on earth, Father, and to take care of all that we must. We pray all this in your Son's precious name, Jesus Christ. Amen. like to thank each and every one of you for coming this morning. Uh, just uh, remember our next uh, Wednesday service will be on Tuesday for Thanksgiving week. Please everybody be safe if you're traveling. And uh, we would like, in our closing, we would like to ask Brother Larry to close us with a prayer. Let us bow together. Holy Father, we thank you for thy love. We thank you for thy mercy. We thank you, dear God, for this privilege of worshiping you in song and in gathering around the table to commemorate the death and the suffering of thine only Son, Jesus Christ. We are ever thankful, Father, for thy mercy. We pray that you will be with each of us, dear God, and that we would love you more each day of our life and live our life in such a way, Father, that will bring honor and glory to thy holy name. We ask thy forgiveness of all the things, Father, that may be amiss within our life. We repent of those things, Father. We ask thy forgiveness, and we pray, dear God, that we would ever look up unto you for your goodness and for your love that you have for each of us. Thank you for thy word that guides our life. May we search it, and may we live it, every day for you. Be with this congregation, Father. Help each family to do their best to love you and to share that love with those round about us. Guide us, Father. Protect us along the pathway of life. And when thou hast no further need for us, dear God, upon this thy creation, we pray that we have lived our life in such a way that you would own us and crown us in glory for these blessings, Father. We ever thank you, and we do so in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.